our next speaker has been a giant in dosimetry, uh, in terms of internal dosimetry, and uh, he will talk about a number of things today. Thank you very much. Let's see, a point and click. As Bob Loesch said, I'm an analog guy in a digital world. Uh, I'm here to talk about the Harold McCluskey case, the atomic man or the largest internal deposition, recorded internal deposition in a human that ever occurred. Uh, too often we take a clinical approach to our patients and to our subjects in science. For instance, USTUR case is defined in health physics by Jim McEnroy as a 76-year-old man who died of cardiovascular disease 11 years after massive percutaneous exposure following a chemical explosion in the glove box. Scientifically, it's absolutely correct. What I want to do today is bring a little more of the human aspect to this. Instead of being a 76-year-old man, I want you to meet Harold McCluskey. Known to his friends and co-workers as Mac, who later became known in the popular press as the Atomic Man due to the events that I'm about to describe. On August 30th, 1976, that's 40 years ago at the end of this coming August, about 3 o'clock in the morning in uh, the state of Washington where we're at. Uh, for those of you from out of town, uh, we're sitting here up in Spokane, about 200 miles away is the Hanford site, uh, which covers about 640 square miles. In the middle of it is the 200 West area, and in the middle of the 200 West area is this building called the Plutonium Finishing Plant. And a very small corner of that was the Americium Recovery Facility. And that's where, that, where this accident happened. I don't have enough time to tell you all my involvement in it and how I learned about this accident, but uh, while well, I got a telephone call from an Atlanta office, I was working in downtown Richland, and they said, we hear there's an accident, uh, there's an explosion, are you guys okay? We're in downtown Richland, 25 miles away. What are you talking about. Well, the Hanford's a hole in the ground. They're talking about it on the radio. And we said, well, we don't know about that. It looks fine here. So we turned on the radio to find out what was going on. Well, what actually happened was a chemical explosion, not a nuclear explosion, in an ion exchange column within a glove box. Now, the ion exchange column had been loaded with about 130 grams of americium-241, or 10 to the seventh megabecquerels, which is a number I can't fathom very well, or 450 curies. No matter how you look at it, that is one heck of a lot of americium-241. It had been loaded on the column for five months, contrary to procedure. Why? Six months earlier, five months earlier, there was a labor dispute at the Hanford site. The workers walked off the job, leaving the ion exchange column loaded. Uh, after five months, when the labor dispute was settled, they went back to start up the column, and they had not understood that there could be a chemical reaction from the uh, hydrogen gas buildup caused by radiolytic decomposition from the alpha decay of the americium-241. Uh, this had never been experienced. This kind of degradation in the ion exchange rosin, in the cation exchange rosin, had never been experienced. So when the process was restarted by eluding with seven molar nitric acid, the operator heard hissing. He's observing this through the leaded glass window. He observed brown fumes venting from the column, and he noted warm gloves. He then noted more hissing coming from the bottom of the column. He turned to tell his coworker, it's going to blow. And as he was stepping down from the st step ladder, which is much like the one on my left, um, in a position kind of like this, the explosion occurred. The blast caught him on the side of the face, right-hand side of the face, knocked him to the ground. It peeled open the ion exchange column, blew out all the leaded glass windows and glove ports, blew out all of the gloves, blew out the plastic, metal, um, struck Harold McCluskey, our subject, age 64 at the time, on the right side of his face, peppering his face with glass shrapnel, concentrated nitric acid, resin beads, and americium-241. He received immediately chemical burns on his face, eyes, neck, and right shoulder, and many, many lacerations with the embedded foreign particles. This is what the room looked like. The picture on the left shows the americium recovery facility with several glove boxes, and at the far end of the room, you can see a man stand, kneeling on the floor. That is the actual glove box that exploded. This is pictures before the explosion. There's some speculation that this is Harold McCluskey, but we have not been able to confidently say that. 
Um, we blew up the picture quite a bit and looked at it. I asked Dr. Breitenstein, who was the lead physician, he wasn't convinced either. The picture on the right is what the aftermath was. Here you see the step ladder he was on, here you see the blown out glove ports. For a little better picture, the ion, ex the ion exchange column was behind this rectangular window. Again, here is the step ladder he was on. This is the ion exchange column itself. It was three feet long, six inches in diameter, Schedule 10 steel. About 110 PSI overpressure created by the blast. It bulged the sides of the glove box. The initial response was to, for his coworker, who was at the opposite end of the room, was to help him from the room. The, the room was filled with fumes and w visibility was limited. A nurse was immediately summoned. His clothing was then removed and his face, eyes, head, and shoulders were flushed with water. And this was done in a sink w using rags. And the reason they didn't use a safety shower, and this is an interesting point that will come out more later. Um, a few months earlier, he had undergone bypass surgery, and they, his co-workers knew that. They were concerned that hitting him with cold water on top of everything else might put him into shock. So they wanted to decon start the decon process, but they didn't want to run any further risk of doing harm. The skin contamination levels exceeded all of the Alpha Survey Instruments' highest scale readings. He was transported about an hour and a half later by ambulance to the emergency decontamination facility 25 miles away in Richland, Washington. His initial treatment upon arrival, he was met by Dr. Bryce Breitenstein from the Hanford Environmental Health Foundation, was to have one gram of calcium DTPA administered by IV injection. He was walked in, on it, under his own power, he walked into a shower at the emergency decontamination facility. It was actually a staff shower intended for use for deconning staff following an incident. But um, in this case, he could walk in, and so he showered there for a while. Uh, then he was transferred to a surgery table or a decon tub, um, glorified bathtub, if you will, for debridement. He was bathed with mild liquid detergents. The vigorous scrubbing was not possible because of the acid burns. And again, the direct alpha readings were so high they were off scale for the portable survey instruments that were available. So the technique was to identify 19 different places on his body and take smear samples from there, hold the smear samples away and count them with the portable alpha meters, and use that to monitor the decon process. Uh, here are some numbers that have been estimated uh, from uh, the contamination levels initially deposited on his skin and clothing at the accident, 40 to 190 gigabecquerels. I, I just, I can't register gigabecquerels very well. <laughs> uh, the early response, uh, the time of the early response, mostly facial contamination, now it's down to 220 megabecquerels. Uh, 12 hours afterwards, we're down to about 70 on the face, and within a few days, that's down to about 7 megabecquerels. I can almost understand that number. I'm an old-fashioned guy. Skin decontamination process that proceeded was to shower him, bathe him, scrub him, and debride. Debride is to use uh, tweezers, forceps, just pick away the stuff that they can find from the wounds, from the skin, from the scabs, and so forth. He got twice daily baths for the first week and then daily for two months. Calcium DTPA was applied superficially and rinsed off, and there was light scrubbing with mild liquid detergents. Uh, a variety of decon agents were tried during the first two weeks um, and techniques, but basically they didn't find it made much difference. Uh, from day 10 on, the reagent of choice was something called Schubert's solution, and it took me a while to track down that composition. Uh, tartaric acid, citric acid, DTPA, and calcium chloride combined with liquid or mild baby shampoo. And I like to point out, uh, this is basically the same type of decon technique we recommend today, mild soap and water. Uh, daily showers he underwent. Um, he did his own scrubbing, uh, and, and the logic there was very simple. He could put up with as much discomfort as he wanted to, and he quit when it hurt. Here's what the decontamination process looked like. Um, I mentioned the glorified bathtub. This is it here. It's just a stainless steel tub with the shielding. It was, the facility was designed to handle high-level alpha, uh, beta gamma contamination like occurred in the SL1 accident, never was used for that facility. This one accident is uh, closest to whatever, to, to what it was actually designed for. Alpha contamination, you don't need to worry much about shielding, obviously. Uh, the, the tub had a, basically a handheld shower unit, just like you might have in your own home, except this one was stainless steel. Uh, you'll notice on the right, they're surveying his face. 
Uh, if you look close, you'll see they're in protective clothing with full face respirators. At that time, we called them assault masks. And you'll notice over here on the left, they're wearing basically splash shields on their faces. Uh, the difference is about one week in time. The, during the first week, the resuspension from Mac himself was significantly high and met the, can, met the criteria for workplace airborne contamination areas. So people wore respirators. By the end of the first week, the, the airborne levels were sufficiently low that all you had to do was basically splash protection. Um, the daily debridement continued for four months removing things like scale cross scabs, the uh, pieces of metal, plastic, cloth, and glass. The largest piece was about half a centimeter inside. It was a piece of glass that was extruded from above his right eyebrow. Simply put, the decontamination was extended, extensive, difficult, and never complete. He, had, he was contaminated for the rest of his life, hence the name The Atomic Man. I also like to point out when I do this talk for advanced radiation medicine staff or medical staff that none of the attending team incurred any recordable radiation dose or intake of radioactivity as a result of the uh, protective actions that were taken during the course of pa patient treatment, decontamination, and care. And being an internal dosimetrist, I got to qualify that a bit now because at that time the standard method of monitoring was a urine sample. Urine sampling for americium is not particularly sensitive to low level de intakes. Uh, if we were to do, if we had done fecal sampling on the staff at that point, I'm not sure we would have had the same statement to make. Um, it wouldn't have surprised me to see some low level, very minor intakes on the order of a few millirem by the treatment staff, but uh, nothing of any significance. Uh, more pictures of the skin decontamination. Um, here in the upper left, uh, he's being, they're using the uh, uh, spray, the handheld spray on him. Uh, I'd like to point out here, uh, there's heat lamps again. He was, while the facility had temperature control, he was getting wet down. He was pretty wet. He was naked. Um, so he was getting cold. So the heat lamps were for personal comfort. Uh, over here, you see them uh, doing debridement using forceps, uh, water picks. Uh, I think that's a, a cotton Q-tip. Uh, you can just see more of the same of how they're doing it. This is looking at the area above the right eyebrow particularly. How do you know how much is on him and where? So the first thing that was done was a gamma camera, a series of sodium iodide detectors you're probably familiar with. And that, that gave you a gross indication of where the location was but didn't quantify it. And Earl Palmer, who was managing the whole body counting facilities at Hanford at the time, and, and his colleague Gunnar Ricks, came up with this brilliant idea. They took a nylon, a piece of, a piece of mylar, uh, drew a matrix of, of small squares on it, numbered each square, cut a nose hole and a mouth hole, kind of like a kid's Halloween mask, and wrapped it around his face. Mac then held it in place while a little one-inch collimated sodium iodide detector was used to count each one of the squares in the grid. The resulting map of the, act of the count rates shows the darker the color, the higher the contamination. On the left-hand side of his face, which was the side away from the window when the explosion occurred, very low levels. On the right side, very high. Highest area, again, right above his right eyebrow. More measurements. Uh, here you see Earl Palmer um, measuring the leg bone, trying to see what kind of uh, content has been trans uh, translocated to the, the uh, skeleton, uh, using probably a sodium iodide detector. And of note here is the lead shield placed between, as a shadow shield between the detector and his face, which, for which, the, which there was enough uh, americium contamination that the 60 keV photons would interfere with the leg measurements. You see something similar on the right. Again, here's the detector. Uh, here's the shield that uh, is placed between his face and the detector. I uh, can't quite tell what they're counting. It might be the sternum, probably not the liver. It's a little high up. It might have been the lung. DTPA therapy. At the time of the accident, calcium DTPA was the FDA-approved method for chelating transuranic activity. Uh, there had been some concerns coming out of University of Utah uh, that uh, large doses of calcium DTPA uh, protracted over time uh, was observed to cause neonatal deaths in mice. I believe 
Uh, Daryl Fisher, one of our former presidents, was involved, and that was some of his graduate study work. Um, the concern was that that may have been resulting from trace metal depletion, notably zinc. So as part of the therapy, MAC was given zinc supplements to offset that possible chelation effect. Uh, at the same time, uh, it was recognized that if, if, if the zinc could be administered concurrently with the DTPA, uh, instead of labeling the DTPA with calcium, let's do it with zinc or tagging it with zinc, um, maybe we could avoid this whole issue completely. However, that was not an FDA-approved protocol. Within five days of the accident, Dr. Breitenstein worked with the Food and Drug Administration to get an investigational new drug approval for zinc DTPA. The drug was manufactured at the Pacific Northwest National Lab by Vic Smith in the chemistry lab, and subsequent to the five days, all of the therapy was with, with zinc DTPA. He received a total of 583 grams by slow, all by slow push I intravenous injection, in, uh, as you see being done in this picture, uh, over a four year period with no side effects. They used the same injection site the whole time. They were very careful to make sure scar tissue didn't form, uh, that there was no infection. Um, we consider this therapy life-saving. As you'll see a little later, had it not been for this, the doses received by the liver would have caused liver failure and mortality. Uh, by the way, this approach to DTPA now, using calcium DTPA as your initial injection for a, a th chelation therapy, um, calcium is a little higher efficiency. Uh, it's more effective in theory in chelating, D in chelating plutonium and americium. But the, the, the one gram administration that is given is so massive compared to the amount of transuranic material to chelate in a typical wound that it really doesn't make much difference whether you're going to give them zinc or calcium. It's going to be equally effective overall. Anyway, the approach uh, that was used with MAC, starting out with calcium and shifting to zinc, is the approach recommended today. The uh, standard uh, therapy typically would call for the first injection to be calcium as the more efficient of the two subsequent injections with zinc to avoid any of the trace metal issues. This is my favorite slide. This was done by Earl Palmer and Dr. Breitenstein. Um, what we're seeing here, and I won't go too closely into the numbers because that's not too important, but we are, you'll note, on a uh, logarithmic scale. Um, the, uh, we're seeing here the activity of americium-241 on the y-axis with time post intake days after exposure going out to 3,500 days, 10 years following the accident. Uh, what you see in the top curve here is this nice little sum of exponentials drop off uh, of his facial contamination. And what we're seeing there is not highly effective DTPA chelation, but rather simply the body sloughing off the facial skin cells and normal slough offs occurring. Uh, so uh, it's gradually remodeling, uh, removing the uh, contamination. Again, it never got rid of it, but it did drop a couple of orders of magnitude. The middle picture, the middle curve, is the skeleton content or the bone level uh, burden. And the fascinating thing about this is it's darn flat. Now, this little rise right here is this is when DTPA therapy was finally terminated out about 500 days post intake. And you'll notice that there is a very gradual increase at that point that very gradually continues with time. Uh, it's pretty flat during the whole period of DTPA. What that tells us is the DTPA was extremely effective in preventing bone deposition. What it also kind of hints at is he got an awful lot early on that was put in the bone that we couldn't pull out. Uh, if we prevented it, the buildup from occurring here, uh, where did that come from? That may have come from the first two or three hours of, of, of following the accident. Again, it shows the ineffectiveness of DTPA in removing material from the skeleton. But the most fascinating part is this one, the lower curve. This is the liver burden. Very high, and again, the, measure, the, the, the graph here starts a few days, you know, about 10, 20, 30 days out in time, because uh, it just would have been too sky high to get good numbers to show. Um, we see a very dramatic drop off of uh, two or three orders of magnitude uh, down in, in the first 150, first 200 days or so uh, following the accident. 
We think we pretty much pulled all of the DT, all of the uh, americium out of his liver. And what actually is being shown at this level could well be shine from the bone. This is, this is based on direct bone skeleton measurements and, and liver measurements. Um, after a period of, uh, uh, of about um, two years, he was getting kind of tired of DTPA. He wanted to take a vacation. There were some concerns on the part of his personal physician that it may be interacting with heart medication. And so there were a couple of occasions where DTPA was stopped. When it was stopped, note this spike in the liver level at a corresponding gradual increase in the, um, in the skeleton level. So this tells us there's still a lot of americium, ionic americium circulating coming from where? Well, coming from the face still, coming from maybe recycling within the body. And, um, and it can effect, very effectively be chelated. When chelation was commenced again, it dropped down. Uh, there's this little cycling here, in here as he went through some periods of on and off therapy uh, and, re and changing the therapy schedule. Ultimately, uh, re therapy was reduced to two times a month, which is about in this time frame. And out here at um, about 1,100 days, 1,200 days is when therapy was terminated completely. Uh, again, the two times a week, you can still see it was pretty darn effective chel in, in chelation. When it stopped, then we saw a gradual buildup over, over the rest of his life, really. That, that's my heavy science slide. The therapy limited the systemic deposition to 13 microcuries or 500 kilobecquerels instead of perhaps 500 microcuries or 19 megabecquerels. That's a factor of 40 reduction in the systemic burden. Um, at that time, the maximum permissible body burden described in ICRP publication 2 was 50 nanocuries, 0 0.05 microcuries, or roughly 1.85 kilobecquerels. Um, by comparison, we're talking 13 microcuries versus 0 0.05 microcuries. Major significant, that, this is, no matter how you looked at it, this was a big overexposure. Uh, by the way, bone marrow aspiration on day 16 was interpreted all to be within his normal limits. We knew he couldn't stay forever at the emergency decontamination facility. So plans were begun to how, how do we transfer, how do we make the transition to allow Mac to go home? Now it's nice that his family can come and visit him in the EDF, his pastor was coming, and Mac was an evangelical Christian. His faith was very important to him. His pastor came in, prayed with him, read the Bible to him. Um, Mac, uh, part, but we need, we need to figure out a way to let him go home. We need to figure out what kinds of issues are going to face when he goes home. By day 45, it was recognized that the primary obstacle to releasing him to go home was cross-contamination that might occur from his facial sloughing off, the desquamation from the contamination on his face. So what do we do? Well, they had the innovative idea of moving a small travel trailer to the end of the emergency decontamination facility and monitoring, let him live in that trailer and monitor the contamination levels, survey the, the uh, trailer regularly. So day 79, he moved in and uh, surveys commenced. By late November, he was going out into the community. Remember, the accident happened August 30th, um, and he had Thanksgiving dinner with his family. During the months of November and December, he would go home during the day. Now, he lived in Prosser, which is about 30 miles from Richland, where this emergency decontamination facility is. So he's going home during the day. He's coming back to the trailer at night. And during this whole time, the only place they really found contamination was on his pillow. Uh, his wife and his dog lived with him in the trailer, by the way. Uh, January, five months after the accident, he was finally released to go home. During this time and in preparation of going home, he received psychological support, again through the Hanford Environmental Health Foundation. A clinical psychologist was assigned to him to deal with emotional issues, uh, deal with personal and family concerns that they had, uh, help him deal with questions that others and responses that others might have, uh, and to figure out ways to get the community to accept him. And one of the key factors that came in here was his pastor. Um, Matt, uh, his pastor basically told his congregation, you know, guys, this is Mac, your brother, we love him. Uh, it's okay to be near him. I've been hanging out with him at this facility. Um, he needs your love. Go visit him. Don't be afraid to talk to him, to shake his hand. And that was a critical factor in getting him welcomed back into the community. He was concerned about things like, well, should I go to the same hair 
barber to get my hair cut, or should I you know, shift that around, or should I not even go to a barber? Those are the kinds of things that were on his mind. Long-term follow-up included monthly medical checks by the Hanford Occupational Medicine staff. Uh, my, pit, my involvement with this case came about 1983 when I joined the internal dosimetry group and was involved in scheduling and looking at some of the data that came from his bioassay measurements. Um, we would typically get, for a long time, we would get monthly urine and fecal samples, and when he'd come in for his medical checks, we'd do liver counts and skeleton counts and check the facial contamination levels. His attitude through all this was amazing. I, I met him twice, I had lunch with him twice, courtesy of Earl Palmer inviting me, and the guy was incredible. Uh, you could not, we could not have asked for a more cooperative or better patient. If we wanted fecal samples, he said, no problem, I'll give you anything you want, <clears throat> except for one thing. He didn't join the transuranium registry. And that was because his wife had some objections to that. He, his comment to us was, get what you can while I'm alive, because when I'm gone, it's my wife's body. <laughs> and so we tried. We uh, uh, did a lot of measurements on him. But like I said, his mental attitude was incredible through this. Uh, he was reasonably healthy for about 10 years. Then he went through multiple hospitalizations for uh, physical conditions unrelated to the accident. On August 17, 1987, he died from congestive heart failure due to coronary heart disease pre-existing the accident. Remember at the quadruple bypass surgery that I mentioned he'd had uh, a few months before the accident. That finally caught up with him. Um, an autopsy was performed. Now this is where the story gets really interesting because Mac did not die at home or in a local hospital. He died on the west side of the mountains while he was traveling. And so the, a pathologist was ordered, the autopsy was ordered as a matter of routine. Pathologist didn't know who Harold McCluskey was. And he collected his usual tissue samples. And then when the news reached Richland that Harold McCluskey had died, and it became a news item on the paper. The atomic man has died. The pathologist, and I owe Ron Catherine for this story, the pathologist got the, uh, started getting calls from the press saying, tell us about this guy, what'd you find? You know, and the, the answers came, who, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? The pathologist had no idea who Harold McCluskey was. And when he had written his report and his conclusions, which by the way included the fact that there was no evidence of malignancy in the body, uh, he had no idea of the radiation exposure or the history of Harold McCluskey. 22 soft tissues and five bones had been obtained at autopsy. And I remember Marge Swint was the director of the transuranium registry at this time. And again, I was internal dosimetry, so I had an interest. And I remember talking to Marge about Marge calling me up, or I, I don't remember how the connection was made, but she said, um, uh, Harold is now a transuranium registry donor. And I said, what? <laughs> and she said, yeah, the, the family had contacted him. The samples had been taken. They said we could have them. And I said, what samples did you get? And she started rattling these off. And I said, we got everything you wanted. <laughs> and she said, yeah. So 22 soft tissues and five bones were obtained. Uh, they were given to the USTUR for dosimetry and for analysis dosimetry. Uh, the science, these have been well-published numbers, so I'm not going to dwell on them. Um, Dick Tuohy and Ron Catherine, who are both here, uh, Jim McEnroy is now deceased, uh, all published in, in the... Jim is in the Oh, Jim's in the... I've got the wrong Jim McEnroy. I'm sorry, I'm thinking George Volz. <laughs> sorry. Uh, rumors of his death are premature, <laughs> are greatly exaggerated. <laughs> sorry, Jim. <laughs> Um, so these were published in uh, uh, volume 69 of Health Physics in 1995. Uh, as might be expected, uh, well, the kinds of summary numbers we're looking at, 540 kilobecquerels in the total body, again, comparing that with the ICRP maximum permissible body burden of about 1.85 kilobecquerels. Uh, soft tissue, including the liver, had 55 kilobecquerels, whereas the skeleton had close to 500. Six different methods were used to measure that, and the, the agreement was actually pretty good between those. Most of that was on the bone surface itself. Uh, very little in the bone marrow. 
Again, most of the soft tissue was focused in the liver. And when you look at the doses, uh, there was a little bit in the lung. The dose to the lung was pretty small uh, because it was a, a, a soluble form of material that was inhaled, uh, it cleared the lung quickly. The liver dose, again, eight grays over an 11-year period. Now, forget about our, for radiation protection purposes, forget all about the 50-year committed thing. These are actual cu cumulative doses from time of the accident till death. Eight gray to the liver. Had it not been for the DTPA therapy, it has been estimated that that would be like one gray per day. Per day. We're 3,500 days out now. Uh, so that's why we make the statement that the uh, liver dose would have been lethal and the DTPA was life-saving. Uh, some of the implications for modeling, uh, Ron talked of, in the previous slide about uh, some of the models that have come out of the registry. There was general agreement with the americium biokinetic model that existed at the time. Uh, Ron mentioned a previous transuranium registry case. Uh, the, this was similar distribution to that. Uh, there, was, there appeared to be some greater initial uptake by the skeleton and soft tissue, less by the liver compared to what were the models of ICRP-30 and ICRP-48 that were then in, commonly used. Uh, translocation had not occurred as expected. There was some question as to whether this was radiation related or age related. Um, shorter liver half time was observed uh, about seven years compared to the 40 year or 20 years of ICRP-30 and ICRP-48. Generally speaking, the new models that came out after this accident, ICRP-67 showed pretty darn good agreement with the McCluskey case. Radi what are the radiation effects? I always get asked this, and the people are always surprised. There really weren't that many. Uh, we think the presence of the americium-241 in his face likely sh slowed the healing of the acid burns. Uh, there was a, de a depression of lymphocytes and platelets, but there were no clinical symptoms manifested. Uh, the lymphocyte count, by the way, returned to normal following unrelated treatment with heparin for thrombophlebitis. Here's a picture of the leukocyte concentrations. Remember, Mac had quadruple, bi had bypass surgery a few months before the accident. We had baseline information, which we don't typically, would not typically have had for accident people. Again, a blessing in, in disguise. Baseline information, here's the accident. You can see the drop in, in the uh, leukocyte concentrations with the gradual recovery with, over time, and then a long-term decrease. Again, is that radiation or is that um, normal aging? Uh, the um, neutrophils and lymphocytes showed a similar trending, by the way. And this is all well-published information. Uh, there was a significant elevation of chromosome aberrations in his lymphocytes in the first year after the accident, fluctuating thereafter. The, uh, no direct relationship between that aberration frequency and the typical dosimetric patterns was, was found. Uh, histopathology findings of all of those cells that were uh, various cell tissues that were collected uh, showed a decreased cellularity in the marrow. It was mostly fluid as opposed to cells. Um, there was extensive paratrabicular fibrosis. Uh, he, had, he had scar tissue. And there was a lack of bone remodeling. I mentioned that earlier. That's possibly age-related. Generally speaking, the radiological effects were limited but might have been more pronounced had his exposure time been longer than the 11 years. Other effects not related to the radiation, probably the most significant one was his vision. Uh, you get concentrated nitric acid in the eyes and you've got a problem. Cataracts were removed from his eyes about a year and a half and three years out, uh, determined when they were analyzed that they were probably acid-induced rather than radiation-induced. His vision was compromised by acid scarring of the cornea. He did receive a cornea transplant. And he had mildly progressive photophobia. That's uh, his eyes would hurt in bright light. Uh, I, when I met him in uh, uh, 1985, thereabouts, uh, in a normal, normally lit room, he would be wearing heavy dark glasses, similar to what you would wear leaving the optometrist's office after you had your eyes dilated. That was normal for him. Uh, that improved a bit after the uh, transplants the, the uh, cornea transplant. He had acid scarring on his face. Again, there were no, no indications of malignancy. Uh, Ron Caffin and Dick Toohey noted there was a 12% chance of no malignancy in one of their papers. Uh, his gross and histopathology examinations basically said there was nothing unusual other than those associated with his pre-existing cardiovascular disease. Got a minute to talk about the emergency decontamination facility where he spent much of the time, most of the time. This is the building. There's a little one-story structure behind the Catholic Medical Center in downtown Richland. 
And I find it fascinating when I look at my professional career, these events, when I was a young nuclear engineer working for a, a reactor vendor, uh, were, were unfolding half a mile from where my office was at the time. It always fascinates me to see how career paths change. I never would have dreamed at that time I'd be doing this today. So, um, so this is the building. Uh, this is the interior of the building. Um, as it looked at the time that he was there, this is affectionately known as the McCluskey Chair, which ultimately ended up in a burial ground out on the Hanford site. We wanted to call it an artifact, but the radiological control technicians refused to release it. Um, there's an exercise bicycle here in the corner. Uh, he had a radio, he had a television, but with his vision problems, he couldn't see much on TV. He did have visitors, pretty Spartan conditions, but if you can't see anything, if, if it hurts, hurts your eyes to have vision, to, to, to have lights on, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be really decorated. Uh, in the lower left, you see the travel trailer that was put on on the end of the building so um, we could monitor his living, what, what living conditions might be like when he went home. Uh, there was a major communications effort on this. Um, a very young Dr. Bryce Breitenstein is shown there. Uh, he got newspaper coverage. Uh, there was a lot of public interest. Dr. Breitenstein's goal, along with the uh, Department of Energy's or the Earth Energy Re Research and Development Administration, as it was called at the time, was to provide accurate info, but you also had to protect patient privacy. Uh, I like to talk about the tag team meetings. Dr. Breitenstein and Mac would visit groups, union meetings, community meetings, church groups, any people who asked, scientific meetings. Uh, Dr. Breitenstein would present the science, explain what had happened, talk about the medical side, and then he'd turn it over to Mac, and Mac could just talk about whatever he wanted to from his perspective of the accident. The, uh, the accident was extensively written up. The October 1983 issue of Health Physics was dedicated to him. The September 1995 issue had five post-mortem mortem articles published by the U U.S. Transuranium Registry. Um, a couple of other oddball ones that people don't typically aware of. Reader's Digest in 1991 published an article, and kind of my favorite is in Guideposts in October of 1980, uh, 1981 published. In October of 1981 published this article. Guideposts is was Norman uh, Norman Vincent Peale's Foundations for Christian Living publication arm, and uh, this particular article was written by Harold McCluskey. The McCluskey room itself was sealed for, 35, for, for over 35 years, with, had very rare entries during that time. Uh, D&D commenced on it in 2015. Since then, the glove boxes have all been removed. Pretty much everything is out of the room, and the building itself, along with the rest of the plutonium finishing plant, is unscheduled to be raised to grade level in 2017. And there's a session tomorrow on the D&D uh, uh, work of this uh, McCluskey room, and I encourage you to visit that because it's pretty fascinating. Conclusions, well, not much is different today regarding decontamination methods. DTPA therapy, as I mentioned at the time, is still pretty much the same. And I'm, I'm always intrigued that our radiological measurements haven't changed much. We're still using the same kinds of instruments. We've got a little faster readouts. We use digital instead of analog, but we're still using the same basic types of instruments. So not much has changed there. The medical treatment allow, administered is thought to have allowed him to live a reasonably normal life. Um, the, um, uh, the fact that he had had quadruple bypass surgery in the months preceding uh, did not bode well for long life expectancies at that time, and some argue that he lived as long as he did after it because of this therapy that he got, followed, because of the att medical attention he got following the accident. And the, Transuranium registry analyses provided valuable scientific data for confirming and improving biokinetic models. In conclusion, I'd like to say the accident, while tragic, the response was heroic and the outcome was probably the best that could be expected on all fronts. And to me, one of the real parts of the success story of this is, to, is the relationship between the McCluskey family, Mac and his wife and relatives, and the, the, the treatment team itself, the medical team, team, the Department of Energy. And the way that I best explain this is when McCluskey died, four of the six pallbearers at his funeral were from the treatment team. Dr. Breitenstein, who was the lead physician, Bill McMurray, who was the company 
safety and health representative at the time, Earl Palmer, who did these measurements, and Jerry Esberger from the Department of Energy, who was the overseeing uh, Department of Energy person. And to me, nothing says more about the relationship between the family and the, uh, uh, the treatment people than that relationship. In conclusion, I'd like to acknowledge, this, this isn't my story. Uh, these are the people that really lived it. Uh, these are people I'm privileged to call my mentors, my colleagues, and my personal friends. Some of them are now deceased. This is really their story. I'm feeling very privileged to be able to share it with you. Uh, there's many people, of course, involved that aren't listed. But most of all, I like to dedicate this talk to Harold McCluskey, the atomic man. Um, the picture on the left is Dr. Breitenstein's favorite picture of him. It captures, as he refers to it, his stoic attitude towards life. I can handle this. You're not going to throw something at me that I can't face. Um, his eyes are tightly closed because of the photophobia. And he's smoking his pipe. He liked to tell his coworkers that he was the only Hanford worker allowed to smoke in a radiation area. <laughs> and the picture on the right is the uh, portrait that was taken for the 1983 special edition of Health Physics. Thank you very much. Uh, just a few tidbits about our, our speaker. Uh, he, was, he is a certified health uh, physicist. He's been working for over 33 years on the Hanford Internal Dosimetry Program. Um, he received uh, the Herbert M. Parker Award for Outstanding uh, Contributions in the Practice of Health Physics. So again, a very dynamic speaker, uh, a great story uh, for us. And uh, I think that uh, you guys should come back uh, promptly at 1030. We have some great things to follow. Uh, this is going to be a very interesting session all the way to the end of the day. Yes. Do we have time for a question or comment? Uh, speakers? Go. Thank you. Uh, Daryl Fisher. In uh, 1976, I had just finished my undergraduate work at the University of Utah studying the toxicity of calcium DTPA and the relative non-toxicity of zinc DTPA. I wanted to comment on the mechanism involved, but also acknowledge the outstanding medical support of the entire ERDA Energy Research and Development Administration physicians team from all the national laboratories who, who contributed to this work. I recall uh, Dr. Lincoln from Oak Ridge, uh, C.C. Lushbaugh, and uh, in addition to Dr. Breitenstein, after the accident, a meeting was called in Pinellas, Florida, and all the DOE or ERTA physicians met to help figure out how to plan treatment for Mr. McCluskey, and I, I was able to go to that meeting and, and speak on some of the research. The mechanism is interesting. I think we, we learned in 1975 that the calcium salt of DTPA inhibits cell division, inhibits the... Uh, the tissue recovery, and in fact, uh, works against healing in that sense. It, the, lo the loss of zinc and manganese interferes with cell division, and that's why we had birth defects in, uh, the, in the mouse pups that were conceived during uh, calcium DTPA therapy. But I think the switch to zinc DTPA actually helped in the tissue healing process for Mr. McCluskey. And therefore, it was a wise choice to move from calcium to zinc to the zinc salt. Uh, it's a it's a perspective that's not often expressed. Thanks. <laughs>